All right, hello everyone. My name is Paige Merrill and I wanna welcome you to Museums a la carte and the fourth and final installment of Stories from the Outwin, a free lecture series that explores the lives and work of artists featured in past and present Outwin portrait competitions. The Outwin American Portraiture Today exhibit is locally sponsored by Freedom Credit Union, Health New England and the Mass Mutual Foundation. Anyway, today's program, Portraits with Presence, a conversation with artists Nikisha Durrett and Julianne Wallace-Sterling, moderated by Maggie North, Curator of Art at the Springfield Museums. Hello everyone and welcome. As Paige so kindly introduced me, my name is Maggie North and I'm the Curator of Art at the Springfield Museums. I'm so pleased to be with you for this final installment of our lecture series, Stories from the Outwin. As many of you know, the Outwin American Portraiture Today is currently on view at the Springfield Museum's Demore Museum of Fine Arts. And I'm pleased to say that this fantastic exhibition, which we feel so lucky to share with our visitors, has been extended and will be on view through May 9th of 2021. Organized by the Smithsonian's National Portrait Gallery, the exhibition is a result of a triennial Outwin Butchever portrait competition, which is named for benefactor Virginia Outwin Butchever. Every three years, the National Portrait Gallery invites artists living across the country to submit innovative portraits to the competition. In this iteration of the competition, which resulted in the exhibition currently on view, jurors selected 46 of the best works from over 2,600 entries. And so these 46 finalists are showcased through their portraiture, which is interesting, powerful, and thought provoking. In doing so, the exhibition really takes the pulse of portraiture at this particular moment in time, but also points forward to future directions that the genre may take. And so there's a range of media represented in the exhibition, painting, photography, works on paper, mixed media, time-based media, animation, installation, and performance art. I hope that you will be able to see this exhibition in person if you're local to Springfield. And if you're not, I recommend checking out the exhibition online and keeping in mind that it will travel to the Kemper Art Museum in St. Louis starting in September. I am so honored to be joined today by two fantastic artists who are represented in the exhibition. Their works, James Baldwin, which you see on the left hand of this slide by Nikisha Durrett and Julian Wallace Sterling's Specialist Murphy, which you see on the right hand of this slide, depict different subjects and they use different materials, which we'll be talking about today. But both portraits are really striking graphic representations that draw the viewer's attention to the subject's faces. And they make for these really powerful and present encounters with the people that they depict. So I'm so excited to discuss all of this with you today and to welcome Julianne and Nikisha. Thank you so much for joining us today. Would you both like to say hello and briefly introduce yourselves? Hello everyone. Um, thank you for joining. Uh, my name is Nikisha Durrett. Uh, I'm an artist located in Washington, DC. Um, I typically make large scale artworks that live in public spaces for the most part, but sometimes not. Hi, I'm Julianne Sterling, and I work in the San Francisco Bay Area. I live in Albany, California, and I primarily do portraits with a focus on women. Um, yeah, oil I'm paintings. Thank you. We're so excited to have both of you here today and even more excited to be showcasing your fantastic pieces um, in the Outwin. And so I thought we could start by really taking a close look at these works. Uh, perhaps you could tell us about these pieces, what inspired you to create them and how do they kind of fit into your bigger practice? And Nikisha, maybe we can start with you and talking about James Baldwin. Okay. Um... Well, this is actually um, the second version of this portrait of James Baldwin. Um, the first one was, uh, was produced for the Duke Ellington School of the Arts in Washington, DC, uh, where I teach. 
in the museum studies department and I'm also an alum. Um, so I was invited by uh, the Percent for Art program to, um, to produce uh, an installation for the cafeteria of the newly renovated school. Um, in uh, researching for this project, um, I could not help but reflect back on my days at Duke Ellington School of the Arts uh, as a student in the 90s and thinking about all the ways in which um, this school, which is predominantly black um, during a time when Washington DC was predominantly black and how um, the contributions of African-Americans in American culture was centered and how that um, prepared me for, um, for my, uh, my career in the future. Um, so uh, there were a number, of, a number of artists that I considered for, um, for rendering. And um, I landed at Baldwin, um, which was interesting. Um, just in short, uh, there were a range of people that I was considering. And I teach in the museum studies department um, museums, uh, the museum profession is actually also a big part of my life or had been. Um, so I really wanted to center the accomplishments initially of, um, of a museum professional. And the person that came to mind for me was uh, Thelma Golden. In researching Thelma Golden, it quickly led me to James Baldwin, which then led me to Lorraine Hansberry. Duke Ellington School of the Arts is a very um, black space and it's also a very queer space or at least um, it's an institution that, cel that, that celebrates and welcomes um, the formation of, of queer spaces. Uh, so James Baldwin and Lorraine Hansberry are both queer um, black artists. Um, and I, there was a photograph of the two of them dancing together which made me remember just how um, vital community is um, in creativity. Um, and, um, and so, yeah, so this, that's sort of how it started. And we can dig in a little more later. Definitely. And here's a photo of um, some kids. I believe this is at lunchtime, Nikisha, interacting with the space and being a part of the space where the Baldwin portrait and the larger installation exists. And I think it's wonderful to think about how many uh, students will see this piece and perhaps be inspired by the individuals that it represents. So Julianne, I wondered if you could tell us the same thing. Um, how did you decide to create your portrait of Specialist Murphy? And how does it fit into your larger practice? So um, you know, I think 2015, President Obama, along with the most of the heads of the um, armed forces changed the rules that women could do any role in the armed forces that they wanted to as long as they could pass the physical test. And that was a pretty big change, I think. Um, and I was just interested. There was a, a photographic essays by Lindsay Adario in the New York Times um, women at war, and she had a number of these gorgeous photographs of, um, you know, these women who put on a uniform every day for us, for, for all of us, uh, to defend and protect our country, or be a medic. Um, so I, I did four paintings of female soldiers after that. So there's one, there's Sergeant Graham. Uh, and this is Specialist Murphy. I did a double image. This is a graphite and oil. Yeah. And graphite and oil, the digital camo. Yeah. So. And the digital camo refers to actually the um, print on the uniforms. Is that correct? Right. That was something I learned when I was photographing the women for the reference, I, was, I didn't know what the uniform was actually called. So, uh, 
I'm not sure I recommend spending your time drawing that. <laughs> it was hard. Um, so, but yes, that's what it's called, the digital camo. They have, I think they have a couple different uniforms that they can wear. And so when we were talking about doing the photographs, they, they did ask me what they would like um, me to wear, them to wear. So I take photographs and usually work from that for my work. And you can really see the similarities, you know, between obviously the link in subject matter between that woman, women at war series um, and your pieces, but you've so beautifully painted their faces and outlined these uniforms. And I can imagine that took a very long time. Uh, one thing that comes to mind for me when looking at these works of art, both on their own and then also within the gallery spaces, is that both of these pieces have this incredible gallery presence. And that's, of course, because of their size and the strength of the composition of both of these pieces, um, both Julianne's and Nikisha's, but also because the subjects are really brought to the fore. And I think that we as viewers are really encouraged to think deeply about the presence of these subjects. And so this idea of presence, which is in our title of our talk today, you know, it's, it's also discussed in the exhibition catalog for the Outwin in curator Dorothy Moss's exhibition introduction essay. Um, she writes that the portraits that were selected for inclusion um, in those portraits, the artists were incredibly thoughtful about the history of representation and also about the insistence of presence in their work. And so, Nikisha, I thought this related both to your portrait and Julianne to yours in terms of creating um, a visual document of folks who may not have entered other spaces of representation quite yet, but encouraging us to become present with those people and with their stories. So I wondered if either of you wanted to comment a little bit on this idea of presence or how, whether and how you thought about presence in making your work. Um, I guess I'll go first. Um, I, uh, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a great question. I think it gets to, it actually gets to kind of the center of um, why I make the work that I do. Um, I, I think that um, when you express difference in America as you're growing up as a, as a young person, um, I think that um, America can actually play um, quite a number on you. Um, and I think that, um, that that in a lot of ways shapes who you are and how you see yourself in the world and whether or not you feel that you belong. So I think that at the center of my work is kind of this... Um, uh, this urgency to put forward um, images and language in a way that um, that I think responds to an absence of that particular language and that particular kind of representation. Um, one of the ways that um, that I do that is um, uh, one thing I didn't mention about this piece is that it's actually made up of thousands of, um, of handmade clay sculptures, um, which you can't view at a distance. Um, but when you're, uh, when you're close in close proximity of the image, you act, it's actually very difficult to make out what um, is being represented. It's not until you change your perspective and you step away from the work that you can actually make out that this is a portrait of a person. And depending on your familiarity, familiarity with the subject, that it's actually um, James Baldwin. And then on the other hand, if you're approaching the work from a distance, it's not until you get up close to it that you see that it's actually made up of all these sculptures. And when you get even closer to it, um, you, see, uh, these, you see this iridescent um, sort of rainbow finish on each one of the sculptures. And I think that speaks to how um, voices 
like um, James Baldwin, um, that his presence actually looms, um, for me, um, looms very, uh, very widely, very broadly. Um, but um, it's but it's often um, suppressed and not brought forward. Um, so um, for me, James Baldwin is a is a representation of of the truth. He was a person who um, who never was probably um, one of the most insightful, um, fierce critics of our American democracy and of race in this country. So I think that putting him um, in these museum spaces, how lucky am I that this gets to travel around the world, or travel around the country rather. Um, and that there's this sort of looming presence of the truth um, that, you know, um, the, um, the real big lie in this country is that, um, is that white supremacy is so prevalent and that um, white people matter more than black people and that the United States is this um, innocent, shining city on a hill. And I think that that gets to be, I think it's pretty incredible that that message gets to travel around the country. And we're so lucky to showcase it. I think one thing that is striking about the exhibition that Outwin is that there is a lot of diversity represented and we get to see faces that we might not normally see in gallery spaces, which is really important. Um, and Julianne, your piece also represents a woman of color and a very powerful, strong, courageous woman of color, of course, courageous in a, in a different field than James Baldwin was being courageous. But I wondered if you might speak a little bit to the way in which um, presence and representation may have been important to you? Um, it was important that our, this series, this, it was a very small series, but it include, you know, a better representation of what our military forces look like and uh, the women who put on a uniform for our country. Um, and I, I like in this, I think with presence for this, I've stripped away a lot of the color, except for, um, I love how paint made flesh looks. Uh, I like it's a theme sort of, you'll find in a lot of my, my paintings is that I just love how skin pops and has presence when it's on um, a large canvas with a lot of um, negative space. And I think that draws you to um, Specialist Murphy's face and her poise. And I loved, I got her at this beautiful moment sort of adjusting her hat. So uh, I hoped to honor her, you know, her service and her commitment, uh, you know, with this portrait. And it's not so often that we get to see women in uniform um, even today. So I think it's important to see this and exciting to see this. And definitely for those who have visited in person and looked closely at the, the face and the beautiful rendering of the hands, it's, it's really striking. Um, and I think this leads into our the next question that I wanted to ask both of you, which is related to this idea of presence and the way that that manifests in the work. Um, a question about process, you know, how did these pieces come about and how did you make those formal decisions? Julianne, I loved hearing you talk about how you, you just love rendering faces and, and skin can really pop for you because you have done the uniform in these beautiful graphite outlines. And it's interesting to see that contrast in the, in the portraits as well. Um, and it makes interesting use of negative space, which I think that the James Baldwin piece in some ways does as well. And Nikisha was so interesting to hear you talk about that perspective shift that happens when you come close to the portrait or when you're further away. That's something I've seen people do in our galleries. They sort of walk towards it and walk away from it and try to look at the piece from many different angles. 
So I thought we could look again um, at these two pieces and really talk a little bit more about how the, the nitty gritty of the process and how these came to be. And Julian, I understand when you were embarking on the digital camo series that resulted in this portrait, you actually posted an advertisement on Craigslist in order to find subjects. So I wondered if you could uh, talk a little bit about how you met Specialist Murphy and the experience of painting her. So um, I did post an ad on Craigslist. Uh, and to see if I there were any women who would want, like to model or um, sit for me for photographs for, and I asked for enlisted women. I didn't say a certain um, branch of the military. And I had actually the other model was Sergeant Murphy replied to the ad. Um, and I started with Sergeant, um, not Sergeant Murphy, Sergeant Graham and, um, and then I asked if she had any friends who might be interested in the series also. And um, she did have a friend, uh, Specialist Murphy, who, you know, I just, it felt very risky and sort of vulnerable to sort of put myself out there. It's like, would you like to be painted? <laughs> so, um, and she met me at the gallery and we got some photos of her also. And I thought I saw a question in, the Q and A and Specialist Murphy is just their and Sergeant Graham was their titles uh, in the military at the time that I met them. So it wasn't referencing any other art historical. Yeah. And we do have a photo of Specialist Murphy with the piece, which is wonderful. You can sort of see the likeness and this was at the National Portrait Gallery. Did you take this photo, Julianne? I didn't, she was doing some extra um, training in Virginia. So she got to visit on her own. And I thought that was, was wonderful. She and I have stayed in, in touch. Uh, so messaging, you know, it's, it's my painting, but it's her likeness. So I've stayed in touch this whole time. <laughs> like, is this okay with you? How do you feel about that? Um, the, the image was used on the, the Multi, uh, transit at one point so oh my goodness <laughs> wow. be, yeah wow. we, we we messaged two days ago um on facebook just checking in so, that's wonderful yeah. and i'm sure that you were really able to get to know her as you were painting the piece i'm always curious about how artists sort of find ways to connect with their subjects um while they're making work I often send updates of the work as I go to see if, you know, if I'm going, if there's anything that they're not happy about it with themselves or, you know, everyone's um, more sensitive about how they look than, um, you, you know, that I might feel like, did you like this part or not that part? So. Right, right, yeah. absolutely. Good to keep everyone informed. And I'm curious, as you were um, planning the composition of this piece, did you, you said that you used reference photographs. Did you start with a sort of the face or did you start with an outline? How did the composition kind of evolve? I, I definitely block in the whole figure and, uh, and not with a detail in the face. Mm -hmm. Um, definitely working with a pencil first and then building up the oil. Wonderful. It's yeah. fantastic. Well, thank you. One of one of the reasons we wanted to bring you and Nikisha together was to sort of talk about these processes and the interest in, in space and um, representations of faces. So Nikisha, I want to come back to you. Um, and you sent us some wonderful process photos that we can view and, and talk a little bit about your process of create, the physical process of creating the work. But I also was curious to hear from you first. Um, obviously, you didn't have the chance to actually sit with James Baldwin when you were creating this piece, but you also worked from photographs. And I wondered if that opportunity was sort of a chance to commune with him and to learn more about his story. And if you feel like you got to know James Baldwin better in making this piece. 
Absolutely. Uh, definitely. Um, there are so many dimensions to James Baldwin that are seldom talked about. Um, I just remember, and, and maybe this was around the time that I conceived the piece, um, you know, it's kind of hard sometimes to trace the provenance of a, night, of, of, of a work. Um, but I remember watching I Am Not Your Negro and there was just like a split second on the screen where they addressed his, his queerness. And, um, you know, it's so often that we see both his, it's so rare that we see both his, um, his race and, um, and his, his queerness centered uh, with the same weight. Um, so yeah, as I said, um, you know, the, the research process was pretty extensive. Like that might have, have probably was actually longer than the actual uh, production of the piece. Um, Cause it, there was this thing of like, there are just so many greats. Like I knew I wanted um, the likeness of a significant, uh, a significant black person in this space. Um, and I did start with, uh, with Thelma Golden um, because um, I, the museum studies department at Ellington is this department, this tiny little, this mighty little department that could. Um, and uh, people often don't know that there, that this department exists. And so I, I thought that it would be really cool to kind of center museum studies in this space. Um, and so while I was researching Thelma Golden, uh, I discovered that she actually was a student of Baldwin when she was a student at, uh, at, at Smith College. And there were these, um, it, it, was, it was just after Baldwin moved back to the US from Paris and he was teaching these uh, lectures and like large, you know, these huge sort of, you know, auditorium filling lectures. Um, but there were three, uh, three smaller seminars that were open to five students each and students had to apply to get into these seminars. And so, you know, Thelma Golden thought that she didn't have a chance to get into one of these seminars because she wasn't even um, uh, an English major. Uh, but she kind of like, she found her way in and she was so intimidated by Baldwin um, until, and she knew, she knew because she knew who Baldwin was. So she had been introduced to Baldwin by her father. Um, so she had been introduced to him as like the icon. And so she was very intimidated when she was in class, um, but he would often open up to the students about his, about his life. See, so it was all, it was, you know, a lot of the work that he wrote was um, kind of about this um, sort of uh, inward, inward experience, personal experience, his own auto autobiography that he, um, that relate, that, uh, that he applied to broader social themes. So he would talk about his life in Harlem. And so she came to know him as a fellow son of Harlem, like her father. He actually went to high school with her father along with County Cullen. And so she expressed to him that she wanted to be a curator and that she wanted to curate uh, exhibitions that centered African-American artists. And he just said to her, Buford Delaney, Buford Delaney, Buford Delaney. Buford Delaney was um, an African-American painter, a uh, modernist painter who was also queer. Um, and, uh, you know, during the Harlem Renaissance kind of kept his had, had to live kind of a split life. He had to, uh, he had to kind of live his gay life in Greenwich Village uh, within a predominantly white artist scene um, and bohemian artist, bohemian artist scene and then had to have his life with black folks in Harlem. So he had to keep these two parts of himself very separate. Um, and so at the time Thelma Golden thought of this as um, she thought of it as you know an assignment that she was supposed to do this research about about Buford Delaney, um, and then she realized much later that um, 
you know, time goes on. He, she graduates. He actually, Baldwin dies the year she graduates. And she realizes that he had actually given, given her sort of these marching orders, like, this is your work. These are the people that you need to bring forward. Buford Delaney was like one of the greatest painters of his time, was never really celebrated in the ways that, um, that his contemporary white artists were. And she and he t was telling her like this is your work like this is, um, this is this is what you are to do like you are to be a steward of the culture. And so then that led me to think of like wow like all of these these gems that he has bestowed upon so many, um, and just how just that little, that, that gem sparked, like brought Thelma Golden to us, brought like the Matt black male exhibition about black male representation, which was like the first time I ever even knew what representation was when that show um, opened in 1994. Um, so, and so that was kind of where this idea kind of started to have this portrait made of him kind of made of these black gems. I love that. And we have a close up of those black gems, which you can see are like these beautiful, really actually colorful and iridescent pieces as well. And this is that detail from actually that larger installation, but looks much like what you see when you get really close to the piece in the gallery. And so it's so interesting, Nikita, to hear that you sort of came to know James Baldwin through this other lens of Thelma as sort of a teacher, as a um, somebody who could guide you, but also somebody who you wanted to represent and bring into space. Um, and so maybe you could talk us through how how this came to be. I have some photos that you sent. Whoops, here we go. And here's the first one where you can see the creation of those those polymer clay pieces that are so foundational. Mm -hmm. um, so I had to, this wasn't a lot of times in my work, it, like every project is very different. And so there's always a new approach, which I love. I love like, I love learning how, you know, just how to make things differently. And so I had to figure out how to make these molds of, uh, of these pieces. And like, uh, I knew I was gonna have a halftone image. That was something that I've been kind of play around, playing around with these halftone dots. And um, so I just wanted to think of something that I could do kind of easily in my own home. I didn't have access to a kiln. So I started researching polymer clay and, um, and I started, I made, uh, I made my first um, mold, tried it out, baked it in the oven and it, and it worked. And so then I had to figure out a system, a numbering system um, you know, there would be five different sizes of these, of these dots, um, to make the grayscale. Um, and, uh, and I knew I couldn't do it all myself, you know, collectively those two pieces, and there's actually text in the middle, which you show, there were 6,000 pieces of, of clay. So I had to, I enlisted students who were willing to spend their summer with me. There was only one. And... <laughs> <laughs> and my parents. So that was actually my dad in his garage shop drilling holes um, in the backs of the clay pieces that would then uh, mount onto uh, screws that were strategically placed in the in the panel or in the wall. Um, so there was like, you know, VHB tape applied to the back, double um uh, what do you call it? Gorilla glue would get squirted into that little reservoir, and then it would just it would stick onto the onto the panel. Um, so if you go to the next slide, that's the template that I had to create, which you see is made up of um, circles to represent the the dots, and then there are these little pilot holes that I that I that I uh, 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 overlaid onto the uh, template. And that was where um, after, the, after the template is placed on the wall, um, I, we would use an awl and you can see my student Gabe there. He's like going through 
and making the little, uh, all making the holes, which would be the registration marks for the screws to go in. And you'll see if you look really closely, there's a little hole punched out in the template. And then that's how the number gets transferred next to the hole. And then we go through and we screw in all of the, all of the drywall screws um, and then apply the pieces on top. Um, some of the pieces were too small. The, the hole on the, on the back could only be but so large because the dots were so small. So a screw was actually, drywall screw was too large. So we had to use little wooden dowels. And so Gabe is there putting in the wooden dowels. And then you can see on the left is where we're, you know, we're starting to put the, the pieces on. And you can even kind of see just with this, just with the drywall screws that it actually, you can see Baldwin there. Mm -hmm. It really starts to pop together when all of the all of the pieces are in place. Yeah, and there's so a panel that I had fabricated so that the piece could travel. Sorry. Right. Yes. So no, no, I'm sorry. It's just so interesting to see how even with just those uh, holes cut out, you can start to see the face taking shape. The key that so the smaller dots read as a gray, as a gray, the size. Uh, yeah, they do. As they get smaller, it gives the illusion of a, of a gray, of a gray scale. Scale. Yeah. I love the material. But they're all the same color. Yeah. I love to get to see that. <laughs> yeah, maybe one day we can all go up to, go up to Massachusetts yeah. and all these other places where our work gets to go, but we don't get to go. <laughs> you're here in spirit. Absolutely. And, <laughs> and you're here with us today virtually, which is so wonderful. Now, this is really fascinating. Thank you so much. And I, I did have one last question for the two of you today. Um, you know, bringing it up to present day. This past year, we've dealt with a pandemic, we've dealt with social justice reckoning. I wanted to ask you, you know, how are you doing? How is um, this current time in which we're living uh, sort of transforming the way you work, if it is? And I have some, some recent works um, that both of you have been working on, which I'd be happy to show. And I think Julianne, some of your, oh, here's a few more pieces. The final product of James Baldwin. Um, Julianne, I have a few pieces of yours that are recent works, and I thought maybe you could talk about what you're working on now um, and how your process has changed, if it has. I don't think the process has changed. I'm still primarily interested in women. I was been thinking about mothers um, during this time, uh, I, and... I mean, I think, I don't know about Nikisha. It was hard to work this year. It was hard to, everything that we were holding. And, um, you know, I, I wasn't sure what I wanted to make. So these came uh, um, about later in the year. And I started to save some of the papers um, from 2020, thinking that, well, I don't know. We've never seen a map of a pandemic change I've never seen it. So I just started to save papers and think about what I might want to make. So these, I think I started these in October or November of 2020. Um, and uh, my friend Brianna is on the left and those are her three daughters. Um, and my, uh, it's also my friend Elise and her son, both sort of mothering through this very isolating time. Yeah, I think the number of uh, women who dropped out of the labor force in September was it was astounding. Um, these were some I started earlier in 2020. Some portraits um, of my friend Nadia and uh, my friend Jillian's son Kingston, and those are uh, oil on metal. Beautiful. And that I don't actually normally work this way, but that's a collage of newspapers. It's 10 feet by 12 feet on um, a clear mylar. So it's kind of got a front and back. And I was collaging from the news. Um, it also has in, I think it was May. No, I forget. 
they printed the New York Times printed the number of dead um, from the coronavirus. And at that point, it was 100,000. I think we're more than quadruple that now, right? So that I have the letters, it didn't have to be this way, cut out of th that, that death toll. And there's poppies, uh, which are known for remembrance, I drew on the top. And talk about presence, 10 feet by 12 feet. You know, we've all been looking at these images on screens. It's, I think, different to be sort of confronted with them as a, a physical, um, you know, in this physical format of collage. So it's very powerful. Thank you. And yes. That's, that's a massive scale, Julianne. Yeah. yeah, I've never done it before. And I, I got it hung up from the ceiling. I was very, was very nervous and happy that... <laughs> Uh, I appreciate you, Nikisha, who always works on this large scale. Yeah, so. Yeah, you, you did the opposite of what I did. I actually went in the pandemic, I shrunk down. <laughs> yeah. I started paring down a little bit. And so Nikisha, we, we have a, some photos of an installation that you have recently been working on called Magnolia. Do you want to talk a little bit about how your process has, has changed, if it's changed, um, and this recent piece? Um, yeah, like, like Julianne, I think this was a, a good opportunity. You know, I definitely had those moments at the beginning where it was just, I just didn't know what kind of shape my practice was going to take. Um, with these new uncharted, uncharted uh, circumstances. And, you know, there was a couple of exhibit opportunities that fell through and residency opportunities. And um, so I was feeling a bit, uh, a bit down and uncertain, just kind of insecure. Um, so one of the exhibit opportunities that I had actually turned into an online uh, exhibition. And so I had to, the, the work for that show wasn't made yet. So I had to consider how I was going to make the work for this show from my dining room table, um, because I didn't feel comfortable going to my studio during that time. Um, so I kind of, you know, I, 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 I read something, uh, or I heard an, an interview um, with an artist who said that she put, um, that she would put uh, ideas for titles of her works into a jar and she would just kind of randomly pull them out. And I was like, oh, you know, like I I'm starting to forget my ideas sometimes. So I'm going to start putting my ideas in the jar. And so I kind of had this little jar of ideas and that was Amy Sherald actually had that idea. So, um, I started collecting these uh, kind of thoughts, ideas, putting them in a jar. And I pulled from the jar and it said holes and leaf, holes and leaves. And, uh, and so and that actually came from working on the James Baldwin piece. Um, and so because uh, of the tool that I was using for the template. And so I started collecting magnolia leaves um, there was a tree in my uh, cemetery near my house and I would take these walks there, just kind of reflective, quiet walks where I felt safe. And uh, I was thinking about um, the murder of George, George Floyd, but also the murders of, um, of black women who, um, who don't get the same amount of media coverage. And I wanted to lift those names up. And um, the long short of it is that I started um, perforating the leaves with the names of these women. And Nikisha, were you, you said that you had used um, the same tool to create these perforations or a similar mm -hmm. tool that you had used in the James Baldwin piece. So in yeah. that piece, it was sort of a continuation of part of that process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is a close up of that Brianna leaf. Um, which goes into the larger installation. I was curious to know if you had thought about this as a as a type of portrait. Uh, I do actually think of these as uh, I do think of these as as, as portraits. Um, 
I, yeah, there's, there's a, a lot I could, I could say about that. But I think that sometimes like, you know, when you have a name like Nikisha or Brianna, it's like people have an idea of you before you even enter the room. Like people know that a black woman, if they see your name on a paper and you're like, you're interviewing for a job, they know that a black woman is going to enter the enter the room. So how does that kind of shape the atmosphere before you before you even enter it? Um, so in a lot of ways, like um, our names are kind of a representation of they hold a lot. Um, they hold a lot about um, assumptions, expectations about who we are. Like and can result in snap judgments. And in a lot of these cases, um, these women um, who uh, were murdered by police, uh, their deaths were a result of snap judgments that were based on um, the way they looked, the color of their skin, um, maybe the way, they, the way they talked, the way they carried themselves, if they dared to, um, to be confident or, um, ask why they were being stopped or questioned. Um, yeah, so I definitely see these as portraits for sure. Well, thank you both so much. I want to leave a little bit of time for questions. So I'll sort of close my, my questions here and welcome Paige to open it up for some questions from our audience. Thank you, Nikisha. Thank you, Julian. Yeah, so um, at the bottom of everyone's screen, um, you should be able to go ahead and type your questions into the Q&A box. Um, and then we'll probably take about 10, 15 minutes, just depending on how many questions we get for Nikisha and Julianne. And Nikisha and Julianne, you are, are, you're both teachers right now as well, which we were talking about a little bit um, before we started. So I'm sure that that has factored into the way that you're thinking about making art these days. You have to make art and you have to support your students. Definitely, yeah. There's a lot of a lot of Zoom time. That's another way that I think that my practice has changed. I've probably, I in these past uh, in this past year, I've talked more about my work than I ever have. <laughs> it's so easy to uh, when you don't have to rent an auditorium or uh, you know uh, secure make you know make arrangements for security and all that to have um, a conversation between artists or have a talk. Um, so yeah, and questions from the audience and it just gives me a great way to think about different ways to think about my work when I get asked questions that I haven't really thought about or considered. Right, yeah, we're so grateful for this opportunity for virtual programming as well. I mean, we have had uh, the chance to bring in voices from around the country and um, Julianne is on the West Coast too. So we so appreciate you both taking the time. I have a couple of questions coming in. Um, the first one comes from Jean and they ask what, um, this is for both of you, uh, Nikisha and Julianne, was this your first submission to the out one? No, this was my second. This was my first. I hadn't heard of it before. So I, I went and looked like, what did the p portraits look like from the last time? It was very, you know, uh, there's this kind of oil painting portrait that's very um, uh, traditional. And I was like, I, I don't think I'm going to really fit in on that exactly. <laughs> So, and I, I loved the work that was chosen the previous time. So mm -hmm. I decided to yeah. try, yeah. yeah. And I feel like just through these past couple of weeks of conversations um, kind of around the outwin as a competition in general and, and thinking about portraiture, um, I think one thing that we've all been thinking about is how we define portraiture and how um, 
those definitions can be kind of flexible. And I think it's really interesting just to see the breadth of work that was submitted during um, 2019 and that ended up um, being prize winners and, and being in the, the show that we have at the Springfield Museums. It's amazing just the diversity of um, medium and, and artists that, we, that we've seen um, and then come through these uh, these conversations. So I think that the idea of portraiture is so interesting and it's been great to explore that. Um, I do have a couple of other questions coming in. Um, Elsa asked um, of Nikisha, how long did it take to make the James Baldwin portrait? And then um, Elsa also asked of Nikisha, did you do, uh, do you do the boxes around the leaves? So I think, do you make those frames? Uh, so to the first question, I think uh, it took an entire summer for me to act for the production of the piece to happen. Again, the the research and all of that um, took much, much longer than that, but um, a summer for the production. And question number two, um, I designed the boxes for the, um, for the frames, um, but the, the wooden uh, shell of the box was um, was fabricated by um, by a framer, and um, and there's like a, a velvet lining inside of the box and some other like lighting components and all of that. And I did all of that myself in the mounting of the leaf. And then um, I have one final question, and then I think it'll probably be time to wrap up. But um, Kaylee asked for Nikisha, um, how did you ensure that you were making holes in the magnolia leaves that the leaf between the holes didn't tear? Looks like a very delicate process. <laughs> yeah, it was a very delicate process. Um, the timing had to be had to be right. Um, I would select the leaves in the morning, and I would punch the holes that night while they still had some uh, like pliability to them um, because once they get too dry, then they're too brittle and they start to just kind of disintegrate because it, you know, it's a lot of pressure. I put a stencil on top of the leaf and then I'm punching the hole. And so there's a lot that can happen in that process. So just, you know, starting the, pro the punching process when they're, when I've just picked them up um, from under the tree uh, mm -hmm. was really helpful. Yeah. And then are treated afterwards. They're sprayed with, um, with a varnish to preserve mm -hmm. them. Okay, I think we have one cool. last slide, which just shows um, Julian Wallace Sterling's and Nikisha Durrett's web pages, as well as Instagram. So if you want to learn more about what these two artists have been doing lately, please do visit their websites or their Instagram pages. Um, and Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, I, yeah, I want to thank everybody who, um, if you participated in some of these past programs, the past couple of weeks of the stories from the Outwind, thank you for, for joining us on this journey. It's been so rewarding and so interesting to hear from all these wonderful artists. Um, and join us next week as we kind of transition back into our regular programming. Um, we hope to see you then. Thank you, Paige. Thank you, everyone. This has been so much fun. We're so grateful.